fun. All right, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Brooke Jenkins. I'm your 2022 Future Professional President. And this panel is brought to you by MoShape, of course. And I'm so excited that you guys are here with us. We have a few people on our panel today that are gonna be answering some questions for us. Um, so once again, if you think of a question, go ahead and just put that in the chat and we'll go ahead and get to it. And so first I'm gonna start with some introductions. So we'll just throw it to Chris. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Chris Staley. I am uh, I serve a couple of roles. I serve for Mo Shape. I am the chair of marketing and communications and help man our social media team. Uh, we have actually quite a few of our social media team here tonight, so that's really cool. I'm also part of a Shape America team called the Elite Team, which is Emerging Leaders Innovation Task Force, so that's been really cool. I'm an elementary PE teacher K through six in Lee Summit, Missouri, and also I'm a high school football coach, so I kind of, and I'm a dad, so I have a bunch of hats. So thank you all for coming and uh, hope you enjoy the show. All right, Danielle, you can go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle O'Neill. I'm in Springfield, Missouri, and uh, I'm with SBSPE. And so um, we have like 36 elementary schools in Springfield. And so we travel in between buildings. Um, I do K-5 at Watkins, I do preschool at Boyd, and then I also teach fifth grade at the Academy of Fine and Performing Arts. And um, I'm also on that social media uh, committee for MoShape. Awesome. All right, Sean. What's up, how are you crew? This name, I'm Sean Nevels. Um, <clears throat> a lot of roles, uh, Shape America's podcast host for MoShape. I'm the equity, diversity, inclusion chair. I'm a project manager for Special Olympics and kind of going down my whole list. I'm a former adaptive physical education teacher. I was a high school PE teacher and a head football coach, worked for the state as director of health and PE, and then was also a project manager for Shape America. Awesome. Anna? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Forsledo, and I am Moshe president. And this is Bear. He is our Moshe president assistant. And he will approve and disagree with anything. You, you will let him know. He will let you know if your his voice has been heard. If he agrees with something or doesn't agree with something, he'll know. But <laughs> um, I teach seventh grade health and business physical education in uh, Fenton, Missouri at Rockwood South Middle School. I've been teaching for 15 years. I'm also a former personal trainer for a few years, so I love what I do, and um, I'm just really honored to be a part of this panel tonight, so welcome to all of you, and I really hope that this evening is um, something where we all can get connected and to really um, bring you all in and engage you into our profession. All right, Abby. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Abby Braley. I am currently going to Missouri State. I'm actually student teaching right now, <clears throat> excuse me, in Springfield. I'm actually at Sunshine and Williams Elementary. I'm also on the media team as well. So future professionals haven't really started started yet, but we're getting there. So super happy to be here for you guys tonight. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and get into our first question. Chris, you'll start us off. Why did you get into teaching? Um, good question. Uh, to make a long story short, because we were on time limits, and I know all of us here have different reasons. Um, to be honest, uh, at first, just like a lot of people when they start in PE, I just wanted to be a coach, to be honest. And uh, I just wanted to coach football, coach track, and that was my thing. Um, and then as I went through the program at UCM, I kind of developed a different passion for actual physical education. And I realized I don't want to just be a coach. Um, and uh, that kind of stemmed from one of my professors kind of opened up our eyes about your why. And that's something Anna is really big on. And we at Mo Shape as a whole board, we always talk about our why. And I was a military kid growing up. Uh, we moved around a lot. And I moved halfway through my freshman year of high school from a big giant school in Oklahoma City to a tiny school in Knob Noster, Missouri, where I graduated from a thousand kids to 88 kids in a Knob. And uh, it, it was very clicky. And uh, I was picked on a lot when I first got there. And um, one thing was uh, my PE teacher and ended up being my football coach uh my first day of PE was like hey do you play any sports do you do anything because I just wasn't fitting in and I was like yeah I'm a baseball player and he said what well, position you play I said shortstop and third base 
said, oh, you could probably play quarterback. Huh? I was like, I've never, I didn't touch a football like on a field for a team until my sophomore year of high school. So this was my freshman year in PE. I played quarterback in PE and I guess I was doing pretty well. And it kind of gained some respect from some of my classmates that were kind of bullying me and stuff. And then my, my PE teacher and football coach, just the rep, I took PE all four years because of him. And he just really pushed me to be a better person. He was, he was there for me, you know, because one of the kids that was picking on me was an all state football player had already established himself as like Mr. Popular at the school. And he, he pulled him aside and said, you're not going to, you're not going to treat him like that. And this was way before, you know, the social emotional learning stuff that we're focusing on now and the mental health stuff. When I was in, in school, I mean, I'm not aging myself too much here, but, uh, it was sports focused and fitness focused. It wasn't what PE is now. And so just seeing what he did for me um, and how he uh, just was there for me mentally. And then obviously helped me gain a love for football and just all that. I just wanted to take what he did for me being there for me and providing for me and provide that to my students. And that's why I'm here. So. Awesome. All right, Danielle. Um, I've always had a love for health and wellness, which I'm sure all of you guys can relate to that. Growing up, I was always active. I did several sports. Um, and so that passion has always been there. But once you become a teacher, and right now I've had four years at a Title I elementary school. And if you know anything about Title I, that's high poverty, um, trauma-ridden students. Uh, it's very tough, but it has definitely changed my philosophy and like why I'm here. Um, they, nece they don't necessarily have those skills or the knowledge to know how to lead a health and, you know, a, I guess a, he uh, a healthy life, you know, make those choices because they might not have those choices at home or they don't have parents who care to take them out and ride a bike or go on a walk or anything like that. And so being that advocate and the voice of my students and helping instill the love of moving your body and finding that fitness, finding your fitness, that's kind of one of my big little sayings in my classroom. Um, is really important to me because I think it really comes young and they need to know that PE is not just sports. There's so much more to being active in fitness than just sports. And we do a lot of that. Um, and also just creating them into a well-rounded human being. I mean, we develop so much, like Chris said, social, emotional learning and um, personal and social responsibility. There's so much that plays into it. And I think getting at them young and also letting them know that you're in their corner and you're going to advocate for them and fight for them no matter what. And you just love them as fiercely as you can. So that's my why. Awesome. All right, Sean. You know, my path was kind of, it was kind of close to a QB one Staley over there. I wanted, I thought I wanted to be a big time coach and everything, but at first I was actually a, a sociology major at the university of Iowa. Then I transferred to, what was uh, Southwest Missouri State University then became Missouri State University. Uh, transferred there as a criminal justice major, but you know didn't find it didn't find it fulfilling. So you know, kind of looked around, thought about what I was passionate about, which was sports. I played baseball, basketball, football, and um, I mean, it was between athletic training and physical education, and I put my finger on it. And I was right. I chose right. And fortunately, I had the opportunity before I chose physical education to meet wonderful, uh, the wonderful staff and faculty of Missouri State University in the Department of Kinesiology, some who may be in the house right now. Shout out to Missouri State again. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, following along what I learned about the coaching side is in order to be a great coach, you have to be a great teacher first. And that's what um, those instructors, you know, instructors and professors really instilled in me is that I had to be a great teacher and to really hone that craft. And, you know, honestly, through all of that to the point I am now, it's taught me to be a great leader. So I thank those that helped me along the way into, you know, where I am right now. All right, Anna, all you. Hi, everyone. So, um, just shout out to Sean, because he and I have known each other for 20 years now, and I'm not dating myself, I promise. Um, but we did we both go to Missouri State, formerly known as Southwest Missouri State. So shout out to all you bears on the screen right now. I know I see some of you out there. Um, but my why, and it is something that uh, Chris had said previously, is something I'm very big on. It's something I, I very much so believe is a starting point of why you get into this profession and you have to figure out why you do, you know, why you do what you do. And Simon Sinek said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so <clears throat> my why is 
is really from my past. And I, I really, I struggled growing up, um, really succeeding and, and I had to work twice as hard as anyone else in order to be successful or make a team or to get straight A's or to get good grades. And, um, you know, it didn't really come easily for me at all. And um, I was bullied a, a lot every day when I was growing up, which some of people don't know, some people do know, but um, it was uh, it was very intense and I did not enjoy PE. I'm gonna be very honest with all of you. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy PE at all for the formative years of my life. And I think that um, because of my, and my experience and um, because of the people, the peers around me and because of the, the, the lack of support that I felt, right? So um, I really just used those experiences as fuel for myself to become successful. And I decided as a female, um, as I got older, what I wanted it to look like for me to be successful as a leader and as a female and to feel good of who I was in my own skin and to feel, feel good and feel, to feel confident. And I used my past as fuel because I, I decided at that moment that I never wanted any of my students to feel the way that I feel, that I felt so many years ago. And I still to this day never want those kids to feel the way that I felt. And, you know, it was really personal for me. And so creating what I do now is, is, um, is very personal. And I'm, I'm very excited to be on this call because I really just feel like I've been called to um, demonstrate that regardless of your circumstances or your struggles or, or uh, wherever you come from, you know, you can be successful and you can create your own mold for yourself. And you don't have to abide by society's molds and what they say that you can and can't do. You get to create that for yourself, regardless of anything else. And that's what's really powerful. It's your choice and your power. And I feel like that's what I really try hard to demonstrate for my students, no matter what. And so that they can see that they are able and capable and they feel empowered to do so. So I just want to empower all of you tonight to do that and just know that you all may be on the call tonight as a future professional. And some of you may be know exactly what you want to do and know exactly what your path is. I did not get into health and, physical, health and physical education to be a coach. I got into health and physical education to be a teacher. And um, I got into that first and coaching second. And I feel strongly about that. And I encourage any of you that aren't sure to reach out and ask. And it's going to be really awesome. Then, so. All right, Abby. Hey, so being you know not necessarily a teacher just yet kind of starting out i've over the past few years you know kind of in this newer generation there's a lot of bad influences you know there's tons so we don't really need to name them. i think everybody kind of knows um so just kind of being that advocate for those kids who may not kind of like danielle said i've noticed especially right now being in a title one school you know kids don't necessarily have all of the access to having positive things in their life so kind of helping students in that aspect and even kids that may have all the tools and necessities but showing them the benefits of it also um you know growing up I am from Raytown and everybody from Kansas City and everybody's like oh you're not gonna do anything good you know whatever but kind of being that person that just kind of helps the student you know not necessarily just being a PE teacher or a teacher but just that person per se um somebody that some a student looks up to I know I always look up to my students um, and just show them, you know, there are ways to live a healthy life. You can make the right choices. Um, and just kind of be in that person for them. Yeah. Awesome. So our next question, we'll head back to you, Chris. What has been your biggest obstacle so far other than COVID? Oh, my. Um, trying to get Abby Braley to come to my school more so she could teach my kids so I can have a break. Uh, no, uh, real quick before I get to this, I'm a big person of uh, giving out some roses here. And I just want to give out some roses to Anna, Sean, Danielle, and Abby Braley for being on this call. I was going to do it earlier, but uh, these four have been 
Uh, Anna, Abby, and Danielle are on my media team with me, and they have been phenomenal. And Sean's been one of my really close friends for a while now. And just I just wanted to give out some roses and just listen to you guys talk about your whys. I mean, we don't really get to talk to each other about that stuff so much because usually when we're talking to each other, it's business oriented. So uh, thank you guys for being vulnerable and sharing that stuff. But uh, I forgot what the question was. Oh, biggest obstacle other than COVID. So uh, I'm an elementary PE teacher. My biggest obstacle is I don't get to see my kids as much as I'd like. So uh, the school I'm at right now has about 500 students. Um, we have three classes per grade level, a couple grade levels have four. Um, and once COVID started, they went from daily rotations to weekly rotations. So right now I see seven classes for a week straight. And then I don't see those kids again for three weeks. And I think that is my biggest struggle is I obviously I want to advocate for them to get more PE. I feel like they, I mean, it's physically impossible for them to get it every day. We know that unless I want to teach 10 minute, 20 minute classes, and it's just not realistic, but um, we actually found out today they're sticking with the week long rotations next year, which kind of was a bummer for all the specials teachers because the same for art and music. And it's just a struggle because yes, I want to look, look on the physical education side of the physical health, you know, that they're not getting as many, much activity as they need um, kids. And you, you can tell when the classroom teachers have PE that week, they love it because they're like, oh, thank goodness. The energy levels are different in our classrooms when they have PE. But also on the relationship building side, it's really hard to build relationships, especially with the kindergarten, first and second graders, when you see them for a week and then you don't see them for three weeks. And like, there's still so many kids' names. I just don't know. It's just, it's hard. And then I also coach football at the class six level with 125, 30 kids on our football team. So remembering names is tough, but it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't reach every kid more. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be that issue. All of you are going to deal with it, especially at the elementary level. There's always going to be some kind of scheduling flaw because there's X amount of students, but there's so many teachers that you've got to work their schedules in. And, and like right now, I don't have a true plan period. It's broken up into two, like 20 minutes. Abby knows because she, she's like, when do we get a break? I'm like, Abby, we don't get a break here. I mean, go eat your sandwich, get back in the gym. Let's go. But that that's something I want to do because I wanted to see my kids more. And, um, you know, next year, sixth grade is moving to the middle school because we're getting another middle school. So it'll be a K-5 building. So that will give me more minutes with individual classes, but still not as many interactions. So how I like counteract that is I, I, I purposely, when I'm not in the gym, I will walk around, go to classroom sometimes, and especially kids I haven't seen in a couple rotations just say, hey guys, how you doing? Coach Daly, we haven't seen you in forever. I was like, I know, guys. And it, it's really tough, like with units as well, because some units you can get done in three or four days. And then you're like, do we really want to start a new unit on a Friday and then not see each other for three weeks and then just have to revisit that? So it's a struggle. Um, this is my first year at this district. Before this, I taught three years at a middle school level where I saw my kids every day. Um, and then the year before that, I taught at high school. And the year before that, I taught, I've taught every level. And uh, that's been the biggest struggle for me getting back into the elementary setting is just not being able to see my kids every day and that relationship piece. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if you're a strong educator and you show the kids you're there for them, it doesn't matter if you see them every day or you see them once a month, they're going to remember who you are. They're going to still confide in you and come to you. And that that's still a reward trying to make the best out of something that's not necessarily the best. So. All right, uh, Danielle, floor is yours. That is a pretty terrible schedule, Chris. I didn't even know they did schedules like that. That's crazy to me. Um, I've got two. My first one is actually really quick, um, and it's going to apply to a lot of you guys that are, you know, maybe graduating soon or applying for jobs. Um, when I first applied, I didn't find anything. I subbed for a whole semester, and then I spent three years teaching not PE. Um, I was able to luckily still coach basketball. That was kind of my thing, um, but I taught family and consumer sciences you know, mm -hmm. facts or home ec or whatever you want to call it. So get your foot in the door, even if it's not PE and it's outside of your comfort zone, go test in some other area, get certified, get that teaching experience under your belt. Because even the things that I learned as a classroom teacher still somewhat um, apply to what I'm um, doing now. But 
my biggest overall struggle. And if you've ever talked to me, I'm very, you know, like Chris said, I'm very vulnerable about what I talk about because I like to keep it real and I don't hide anything. Um, I was very blessed. My background, two parent home, you know, small town, no drugs or alcoholism or nothing, you know, typical small town raising. And so uh, my first PE job was elementary into a Title I school in North Springfield. And if you know Springfield, you know what I mean when I say North Springfield. And so it rocked my world. It was, we started in August and it was late September, maybe early October. I was in the principal's office and I told her, I said, I can't teach her. I'm going to walk. And um, that whole first semester, I was crying in my car, my 30 minute drive home, crying to my mom, just how terrible these kids were. They were cussing at each other. They were cussing at me. I couldn't use equipment. They would beat each other. I was getting hit. Um, I had never experienced anything like what that was. Like I said, my background wasn't there. You know, I thought in my interview, they asked me how I could handle these behavior kids. And, you know, I thought I knew because I had taught for three years, but in reality, I did not know. And uh, like I said, I was ready to walk away from teaching completely. And uh, luckily I found my tribe and, you know, they talked to me about relationships and the patience and what it takes. And I hung in there and I was consistent. And um, that's going to kind of fall into our next question la uh, later. But in just four years, I went from crying in my car for a whole semester um, and ready to walk away from the, the profession. And then last year, I actually won uh, Most Shape 2021 Southwest District Elementary PE Teacher of the Year. And so I have made such tremendous growth. And I, But I always just want others to know that you may see that award and think that it's so great, but it has a story behind it. And... Um, I will tell anybody who's willing to listen because it's not easy, um, but those kids need you. And I know your mental health is important. And that's why I say, find your tribe. So if you get out there and it's tough for you and you don't have someone to reach out to, reach out to me. I've got a Twitter. I've got an Instagram. I'll give you my phone number. I don't care if it's three or four years down the road, reach out to me because I've been there and I can help you through it. Okay. So it's tough, but it's worth it. And I love my title one kids now. It, I, I don't. It's hard because there's other openings and then because I teach in a little cafeteria, like a small little APR. And so having a full size gym and those openings, but the thought of leaving them, because like I said, my why is wanting to be that person for them. It, it makes me very sad because they have a lot of people coming and going in their lives. Maybe they're homeless or foster kids. And um, I just didn't want to be another adult who walks out on them. You start to develop those relationships and it really helps. Like the behaviors are still there, but when you have that relationship behind it, it just really helps. So if you need me, I'm here. <laughs> awesome. All right, Sean. I'm going to take uh, Danielle. That's why I'm going to need you on the podcast. You know what I'm saying? You got a story that everybody needs to hear. And I actually, excuse me real quick, just listening to that story because I taught in North Springfield. I'm a little emotional right now listening to Danielle because I kind of, you know, yeah. Actually, can, can we take a pause on me? Let somebody else get it? Yes, of course. We can We can go ahead and go to Anna. We'll come back to you, Sean. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Brooke. I appreciate it. And, and um, you know, I love what Danielle said about, first of all, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Chris, and everyone for being so transparent and honest and and being courageous to be vulnerable on the call tonight because this is this this is hard stuff, right? You know, um, I, I did a session a couple of years ago about like first year teaching the 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 good, the bad, the the ugly, and the nitty gritty. That's why I really wanted to like name it, and I don't think I named it that, but it was that's what I wanted to say: it. the good, the bad, the ugly, and the nitty gritty. And Chris was there, and um, it was really just allowing a space for people to ask questions that they went to school and, you know, they went and asked questions, but they didn't get a chance to ask questions, you know? So, um, but I just want to say thank you to all of you who have been so vulnerable and um, shared so much because it's, it's not easy and people need to hear that. And that's why the theme for this year is sharing our story. And so, you know, some of our, you know, so much of our story is not the pretty stuff, you know, and that's not the easy stuff to share, but I encourage all of you to share it and to continue to, because that's part of the advocacy piece. And that's part of staying connected, getting connected and staying connected and forming relationships, 
And that's why we do what we do. And that's why we have this strong Moshe family. You know, I, I mean, I, I have some of the most wonderful relationships on, on the screen right now. And then I'm so grateful for all of them. Um, so going back to the question of my struggle, um, for me, it's balancing it all together. And last year I shared a little bit, or I'm sorry, um, in September, I shared a video about an experience that I had had last summer about an anxiety attack that I had. And it was really guys on the call tonight. And he was actually on the phone with me, um, experiencing me going through this at the same time. And, um, you know, it was the scariest moment of my life. And, um, I, and I translate that. And so I really thought I was going to die. I, 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 um, I was driving at the time and I just, I, I started hyperventilating and started to, I went black and it was a very scary. So please, I don't want to say all of it out loud, but, um, it was a wake up call for me because, you know, I, um, I think so much in reflection as educators, we take so many things on and as future professionals and as young professionals, you want to do and you want to succeed and you and you want exposure and you want to get this job and you want to take all these things on to be successful. But I think one of the most things, important things that I can share with you is as much as you want to do that, you also have to decide and choose what are your healthy boundaries going to be? And where can you really try give all of your energy and passion into really being successful? You know, and that's, it's a really, that, I think that's a really big thing, but balancing it all together. And um, so often we take one thing on, then we take another thing on, and then we take another thing on. And it's something we do as health and physical educators in our field. We just offer and we say, yes, and we say, yes, and we say, yes. And before you know it, it becomes this thing where it's so overwhelming and we don't know what we're doing. And then we have the ramifications of it. So I just encourage you. I love that all of you are on this call tonight. And um, it's not easy for me to share this because I, I, I don't want this to spin negatively. Um, but you asked what my struggle was. And I think that was part of it was really just learning how to balance it all together. And um, especially with COVID, we have taken so much on. We've been literally asked to shift our entire class, do a 180 overnight, and then still be able to handle all of the relationships and all of the emotions that our kids have while dealing with our own emotions. And that's a lot, you know? So just, just recognize it and just decide and understand that there has to be a balance, you know? Um, and it's okay to say no. It's absolutely encouraged to say yes, but if you feel like you're getting to that point, it's absolutely okay to say no. So just find your balance and feel peace of mind with that, you know, but at the same time, I absolutely encourage you to become more involved in emotions. shapes. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing all of you at convention because it's going to be a really, really, really awesome thing. There, some things just fell into place today and I, I am so excited for what all of you are, I'm hoping are going to be able to experience and witness and share with, with, with each other. So um, I hope I did justice to that question. So thank you. Yep. All right, Sean, back to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm back. Thank you. We're sorry about that, but let, let, let this be a note right now that, that everybody in this virtual space and those that may be watching, we are our own greatest advocates all right we advocate for each other in this space and when you know as anna said we've been you know we've been doing this together for a while chris and i have been doing the, this together for a while we support each other you are each other's support in this all right you are not alone you're never alone all right i remember going back to danielle i remember when i, I think i believe i remember seeing her when she wasn't necessarily in the pe classroom just yet and her making her way into the PE class in Springfield and now where she's at right now. We've seen each other through this journey and we continue to support each other through this journey. 
That's why it matters that you stay connected to Mo Shape, your state affiliate, and Shape America if you really have big aspirations to continue your work on a, on a national or international level. Um, but to answer the question, to answer the question, one of my biggest, I guess I'll go class, and one of the biggest things was um, <clears throat> just meeting all the students. Um, I'm going to say I was highly fortunate in my first three years of teaching to be teaching adapted physical education in multiple buildings, K through 12. And I had to learn quickly how to try to meet all students with all sorts of uh, disabilities, learning disabilities, educational um, diagnoses, everything, and to do the best. And then to take that and then become a, a high school teacher um, in a school which was 54% free and reduced lunch for the time I was with there. So obviously, you know, we're dealing with a certain segment of students. Um, and then it was an international school on top of that. So there was a language barrier. So to take that and, you know, I, I, once again, I was a, I went there as a, a head football coach, so I had these big time thoughts of what you know I had for that program. But really, to get back to it, just my teaching, what whatever I did was all that mattered. I mean, one of the greatest stories I had was um, <clears throat> kind of one of the first weeks of being in that classroom. You know, I had a dress out policy. All right, you know, you come in, you have to dress out ten points. This is a team sports class. I had a student; he had jeans on and boots. And he told me that his mom didn't get paid till the following week and could, you know, could I not dock his points? Things like that, stories like that make you realize that you're dealing with young humans. And then you become that, you become more human and you give them that grace. And does it really matter that they lose points in a team sports class because they didn't dress out? No, what matters is that they're active and they're engaging with their fellow peers. Okay, and that they think highly of you because like Chris said, relationships matter when you teach. If they don't care about you, they're not gonna care about anything that comes out of your mouth or what you're doing. So make sure you get engaged with those kids, be engaged with them, get to know them, get to know them outside of that classroom and you will become an effective teacher. Okay, awesome. All right, Abby. All right, kind of going off of Danielle and Sean, um, you know, they've kind of had the Springfield door side experience, if you will. Um, I think the biggest challenge I've had, you know, with student teaching so far is learning how to be at a Title I school. You know, I've, you, they, you don't talk about that in college. You're not like, okay, this kid's parents just got arrested. This is how they're going to act. You don't, you don't know how they're going to act because one day they could be fine. The next day they don't talk or anything and you're like, what is going on? Or they just start acting out and it's like, what has happened? You know, and you don't know that. I've had to experience that firsthand. Um, it actually happened during one of my observations. And if anybody knows me, I like completely freaked out. and was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to fail student teaching. I'm not graduating college. Awesome. Um, come to find out the next day, her mom got arrested on some things. Well, you don't know that. So I think the biggest challenge for me, you know, you have this idea of how kids should act but that's not reality you know in a perfect world we have kids that listen but when you're at a title one school for example that a perfect world doesn't exist you know you can only do so much but you have to do enough if not more to go above and out of your way to do more for every student um, because they need that extra motivation whereas you know you walk into a perfect school that's you know thousands and thousands of dollars rich well okay whatever but these other kids they really need a lot more motivation I think learning how to do that has been my biggest challenge thus far because at first I was like okay like I'm getting frustrated I called my professors like oh my gosh I can't do this I can't handle it what am I supposed to do like I'm not I'm not getting it and it's not working for me this is not for me at all whatsoever a couple weeks took a deep breath thank you hats for being my personal therapist um I just finished my last 12 weeks today at my elementary school and today I cried because I'm going to genuinely miss those kids I completely yes it has been a huge eye-opener Abigail for sure um you know what the first few weeks I was like oh my gosh this is not going to work out but here I am now and I'm like sad but I'm happy at the same time you know like I've they act like they can't stand you half the time but they truly do love you and I truly have grown to love every single one of those kids that I've met. Um, so I think that, yes, that would be the biggest challenge, leaving them for number one, because it kind of made me sad. But at the same time, just learning and knowing kind of what to do, how to change 
the way you teach um, and just being that person for them, I think has been one of the biggest challenges. All right. Okay, Chris, back to you for our last little prompted question. How do you manage your class and discipline your students? Oh, man. Hot topic if you're an educator right now, huh? Um, in all honesty, uh, there's kind of two parts to this. Um, I'll tell you my school's policy, and then I'll kind of tell you mine. Um, your school, when you get hired, because you all are going to get hired, speak it into existence. Um, and uh, your school's going to have a discipline policy. Um, they, they, they're just going to have to. Now, whether it's followed the way it's supposed to, that's that that's another thing because it's tough, right? Um, we're in a world today where uh, education is looked at a lot differently. Even when I started, however many years ago, it's it's looked at differently every year, every day. Um, but my school is a best school, so it's a be like a behavior intervention support team. And uh, so what we do is if a kid is acting a certain way, first they go to a safe seat, and then they go to a buddy room. And then th th there's different steps and they got to earn their way back. Right. So um, that's what that looks like. Uh, for me, I'm, I don't like kids sitting in PE. That's um, and I know some people will say, hey, kids love PE. So they're, they're going to they're going to sit out and they're going to learn from their mistakes. Not always. Some kids act out maybe because they don't want to participate. They're like, I, I can't stand this. So um, and, and, you know, Abby, Danielle and Sean all have kind of that similar tie with the title one before I was at the school I'm at now I was at a charter school for three years and same thing um, you know I had students who lost parents to gun violence and I didn't you, you don't know those things right away you don't find out till a few days later when the school gets notified and uh, um, I lost a couple of students I, I lost guys I lost two sixth graders to gun violence in three years and so it's tough and so how am I to choose What's the best way to treat them when they act out? So what I like to do, um, and this goes back to, you know, Anna, Abby, Danielle, Sean, we all said this is the relationship building with your kids. If you have a good relationship with your students, a lot of times that helps with the behavior piece. And I, I, I pardon me, I forgot which panelist said it, but they said, I think it was Sean, if, if they don't like you, they're not gonna listen to anything you have to say. And if they, if they don't respect you, they're not gonna respect what you have to say but at the same time you have to respect your students as well and that's really really difficult right like when they're five six seven years old and you're 26 30 years old you're like no I'm an adult like I this is my job like no like you know and, and it's really tough for me for instance I have two young children right a three-year-old and a one-year-old so some of those kids I like try and compare to my kids I'm like hey if my son says that to me oh you and dad are gonna have a talk but that's not our role is to be parents. So just providing them with insight of why their behavior is not okay. We use, I say this to my students all the time. My number one job is to keep you what? And they all respond with safe. That's my number one job is to keep them safe. And that's not just physically, that's mentally, socially, and emotionally as well. Because we want to teach the whole health triangle, right? And so my students know from day one, we, we go over expectations. If, if you can't participate with the class, okay, and you can't do this or that. Um, I have a chill zone, so to speak. I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of resources. So there's a spot in my gym with three exercise bikes. Abby has seen it. And so if a student is frustrated with themselves, like I just, I cannot kick this soccer ball correctly. I just don't know how to kick. I can't follow the critical elements Coach Daly is telling me. They can go over there on their own and cool off themselves. And sometimes I won't even go talk to them because I want them to, depending on the age of the student, um, if they're getting frustrated with a classmate, they're allowed to go over there and they can ride a bike. They don't need my permission. Now, sometimes they'll come up, hey, coach, I'm struggling. Can I go hop on the bike for a few minutes? Yeah. And I will then go over and I try and purposely get over to those kids that are on the bikes and say, hey, do you want to talk about it? And sometimes they say no. Sometimes they're like, coach, I don't want to talk about it. And that's okay. They know, I say, okay, you don't have to talk to me about it, but if it's something that you want to talk about, I'm here to talk to you. There's also a section next to the bikes in the chill zone where I have a basket of just like fidget things. There's like a couple fidget spinners. Actually, the fidget spinners got taken away because kids would just go over there. Fidget spinners are the worst thing in PE, but um, you can use them for good things. If you want to know about that, talk to me another time. But there's that, there's, there's 
like sports related crossword puzzles because there's just so many different things for them to kind of relax. Sure, we want them moving, we want them active, but if they're not safe for themselves or their friends, then we're we're hindering the learning environment at all all, all around. I do not ever. I, I think maybe three or four times have I sent a kid to the principal's office. The principal does not want your kids, guys, unless they're like fist fighting, weapons, like hardcore stuff. Take care of it yourself, and and it's going to help you anyways because they're going to respect you more. Plus, most elementary schools have one principal, and so if you said there, the guys, I've went by my principal's office before, and there's seven kids in line waiting to meet with the principal, and they forget what their behavior is. Right? They, principal says, "Why are you here?" Uh, I don't even remember. And then you got to fill that stuff out. So just build those relationships. Let the kids know you can talk to them. We also, my school, I know Anna does, and I know Danielle does. We all participate in what's called a Shape America thing called Health Moves Minds. It's a fundraiser, but it also provides resources for us. So my kids also do a check-in when they come into the gym. There's a poster that Shape America has created through Health Moves Minds. It has a one, two, three, four, five. And it says like happy, excited. It has five different emotions and then the faces to describe it. And the kids will walk by me and they'll just hold up their number. They don't have to say it out loud. They can hold it to their chest. Like if they're worried, which is a four, they could just put it by their chest. And I let them in, they just go into their instant activity, but say Anna walks into the gym and she shows me a four, which is worried, right? I will go and seek her out during that instant activity and say, hey, Anna, I noticed you were at a four today. Do you want to talk about it? No, coach, I don't want to talk about it. Or yeah, my dog, my dog's really sick. And you'll find out most of the time, like elementary kids, the reason why they're upset, you're just like, oh, like one kid was really upset because they lost their lucky penny at recess. So I went and found a random penny and gave it to them and said, I found it. They were super excited. But building those relationships, letting the kids know they can go to you, that's going to help with your discipline problems 90% of the time. All right, Danielle. Yeah, we have a lot in common, Chris. My, I say that exact same thing. My number one job is to keep you and they're all safe. So I actually used that this morning. I did bikes with Wonder Years kids. And so it was the first time. And so... They all chanted it off. It was really cute. Um, we are a PBIS school as well um, here in Springfield. And so kind of like what Chris said, there's a, they give each teacher a little like guideline. So you, you look at the behaviors, it matches the boxes. And uh, I think that will really help you once you get a job, if you don't have a lot of experience in procedures or discipline. Um, I like to keep what I can in the gym. I don't like sending kids out. We've got a walkie, we have our behavior tech. And so, you know, if a kid's being violent, obviously he's leaving because they know that my gym is a safe space for everyone. And if you're not being safe, you're not going to be in here. Um, and I, I just had to break up, you know, one or two fights. I mean, last week, like early, actually early this week, Monday, I broke up a, a fight with my fourth graders. And so, um, it happens a lot and that's kind of, uh, what you have to think about uh, if you're CPI certified, you're allowed to restrain the kids, but if you're not, technically you're not supposed to hit them or not hit them. Oh my gosh. You're not supposed to, <laughs> I got all these thoughts. I need to write them down. Oh my goodness. Okay. So if you're not CPI certified, you're not supposed to touch them. So that's when you have to make that decision um, with, are you going to allow this kid to continue beating on this other kid? Or are you going to step in and stop that? And, you know, what I did in the situation was, and that for that fourth grader, I grabbed his hand and I kept saying, let's go take a walk. Let's go take a walk. And luckily my student teacher was there to kind of get in between as well. But, you know, I know for my own liability and safety, I can't grab these kids. And um, honestly, I'm five foot four, like maybe 125 pounds. Some of these fourth and fifth graders are bigger than I am. And so I have to think about my safety as well. Um, so I've been getting recommendations to get CPI certified. So if, if you go into a title one school, that might be helpful for you. Um, but just know principals and admin are going to take advantage of that as well. And they're going to call you out of your class if you need to go restrain a kid for some other reasons. Um, and that's why some PE teachers choose not to be. So it's kind of a personal choice. You have to do a lot of reflection on. Um, but kind of what I said earlier with my last question about how I went from crying in my car to winning um, Southwest District Teacher of the Year, I had to do a hard reset on my PE program. That first year I got so much pushback because you need to go in and you need to go in strong with your clear expectations. And it's so much easier to go in hard and then lighten up, then come in and try to be all friendly and fun and you know easy going and the kids are just walking all over you. It's so hard for you to get that back. So when I got there, 
I let the kids know I had high expectations. No, we're not going to be climbing on the lunch tables. You're not going to get up on the stage and grab whatever equipment you want. You're not going to be jumping off the stage. And so I would get a lot of pushback like, oh, we miss so-and-so. They were so much more fun or you're so mean. And in reality, I wasn't being mean. I was just telling them, this is the gym. This is our safe space. And this is how we're going to act in here. And um, that probably played into why that first year was so rough. And these kids didn't know me and who I was. And so we butted heads a lot. And Um, But having those clear and concise expectations and directions, letting them know we're going to do this, but we're not going to do this. Um, They always tell you to focus on, tell kids what you want them to do, not what you don't want them to do. I cover all my bases because if I don't say you are not putting the lollipop paddle in your mouth, I'm going to have a kindergartner over there licking it and biting it because it looks like a lollipop. And that's something that just happened earlier this week. So you have to cover all your bases, make sure you're doing that. And um, actually at MoShape, there was, uh, I can't remember which presentation it was, but I stole it from them and it's worked wonders for me. Um, Normally I would have the whistle or if they hear the whistle, you know, they stop and freeze and they find me or, you know, I do the music signals. So if music's playing, kids are going and they know when the music stops, they freeze, which I recommend doing one of those, you know, always have that freezing signal and let them know what they need to do when they hear it. Um, But Uh, whoever the presenter was it was hey team and then the kids say hey coach and then it's quiet so I can do that during lunch and the kids know I can do it during my bus duty the kids know it's been a great attention getter and it kind of plays into that SEL concept you know we're all a team we're all together um, you know and I I think it just brings my kids together and um, kind of how keeping the kids in my gym would be um, I do what's called reflect and correct. And so I think if, if I have a kid that's running around kicking all my cones over on purpose, you know, I'm going to ask him to go clean it up. And then if he doesn't, then I'll follow my PBIS chart, but I give them a chance to fix that behavior. um, If if at all possible, you know, make the punishment fit the crime per se. And then uh, sometimes they do just need that moment to go sit down. I've got two desks available in my gym. And so if they're having a hard time with sportsmanship or they're yelling and screaming at somebody else because so-and-so is cheating because, Everyone cheats in elementary, apparently. (laughs) So you'll get a lot of that and a lot of criers. So be prepared. Um, But just giving them a chance to get away from that situation. And I give them about a minute and then I go approach them because I don't want a kid sitting out all the PE, but sometimes they need that time to go gather their space. Um, I've got a safe space as well, like what Chris was saying, where they can go on their own if they want to. And I always ask them, like, if they want to talk about it, most of the times they do, they want to be heard. So be there to listen and be prepared to make the right choice um, or a productive choice after that. Not just like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Like, make sure you get ready to have the choices and uh, something that you can do to help solve the problem. Uh, And sometimes you got to be really creative with that and on the spot. So um, quick thinking is involved. But I think other than that, make sure you have for your procedures, you're firm and you're fair, be consistent with all your kids. So that's my spiel. All right, Sean. Yeah, um, what's, I, I'm going I'm to go on my, uh, my EDI soapbox real quick, just, just so, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of who I am. But the thing is, I know we're talking a lot about Title I schools, but please remember, all students have needs, all right? Mental health, things like that, that doesn't have a color. It doesn't have an ability. It doesn't have an age to it, all right? We all go through stuff and all students um, need things. They need to be healthy. They need to be challenged. They need to be engaged. They need to be supported. But like Chris said, they need to feel safe. And that's what it's really all about. And let's still be honest about the situation we're in. We're still kind of on the back end, but we're still within a pandemic, right? Um, We're still dealing with COVID and kids, all kids, all students, even all professionals, and even you all here in this space, have dealt with something, some sort of loss, something you have dealt with in this time. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're engaging all students, all right, is seeing that student for who they are, what they're bringing and what they offer, and what they value, you know, what they value, but also what value they bring to your class, because all students bring value to your class. Um, our question, Everybody said a lot of good stuff. I don't have much to add to this question, even though I can't remember what the question is right now. I lost my notes on that, my bad. I'm just gonna <laughs> piggyback on you, Sean, like what you just said, so. Keep going. 
no, we're good. No, I just, you know, I just wanted to make sure that was noted. You know, I know we're talking, I know it's, it's gone around a lot about Title I schools and even I, you know, work in a school like that. But even still, you're dealing with a range of students, you know, a range of abilities, a range of cultures and values, all of that. And remember that when you go in there, just because you think a kid may be or a student may be more well-to-do um, than another student doesn't mean you give them any less. All right. They may need just as much as you as the student that has to take the bus to school. You know what I'm saying? So always be there and be ready to give your best to all students. All right, Anna, you got something to add? I do. I love what you said, Sean, because that's like what was swirling in my head to to build off of what everyone has said tonight. You know, and um, I so I teach seventh grade health and physical education. Um, so I come from a little bit different perspective and kind of in Sean's, um, perspective as well. Um, voice and choice are very powerful with my students and with students in general. Um, <clears throat> so how I managed my classroom was discipline, um, creating healthy boundaries and standards from the get-go and creating consistency in your classroom is extremely important but also coming from a space of passion and love and grace and space, giving them that grace and space in that room for them to see what they're doing, for them to acknowledge it, and also asking lots of questions. You know, building relationships with these kids um, is everything. And I, and I know that's been the common, uh, the common answer across the board tonight, but it really is about building these relationships. And it's going to look differently for every single kid. And, and, and Chris, I am glad that you brought up Health News Minds. We are we kicked off our Health News Minds event and we did one of my favorite activities today is called From Here to There. And for any of you future professionals on the call right now, um, please reach out to me and ask me about Health News Minds. I, I ask you to do so. I love this program so much. Um, it is a service learning opportunity, but it really is an opportunity for students to be able to actually have a language to identify what they're feeling and then also utilize that language to be proactive and solution oriented to deal and cope with what they're going through. And so many of these kids for the next four to five years need it so much because they are behind, they are struggling. We are all struggling right now. We all need that language and we all need to be able to identify it, but they need, because of what's gone on with COVID, they have been experiencing things for the past couple of years that they do not understand. And we have got to give them something and support them and give them tools to, to figure out how to manage that and to cope with it and then do something about it. So I love that you brought that up, Chris. My favorite activity is, is from here to there. And it's really, it's EDI driven to, to support Sean. It really is about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And because it's about learning how when we walk, when our kids walk into those schools, walk into our schools, every single one of them are walking in to something different with some type of different background. Some of them have already gone through four or five things before they walk into the door that morning. Some of them have only gone through one. Some of them are, you know, so they all have different experience day in and day out. And we have to recognize that and understand it. And then in order to build those relationships and allow them to be feel safe in an environment to feel safe, we need to create those relationships with them, but that starts at the door. So that's what I love about the activity is it really does allow you to create an, an, a, a conversation about what diversity looks like, but also please remember just creating a safe space for those kids to feel welcome and safe and encouraged to share and to do and to feel like they can be themselves and to and to challenge themselves and to try new things because so often those kids are so many kids are coming into the space where they might not play sports and I I always tell my kids I do not if, if you play sports if you do not it does not matter to me what matters to me is that you are willing to try new things and that you are willing to be open to being successful and that you feel good in what you're doing 
so that you can feel empowered to do those things and become your best and then establish what that looks like for you later on down the road, right? Um, and I think I'm getting off the tangent here, but um, it just all goes back to establishing relationships with them and creating a safe environment for them. And part of that safe environment is creating those safe and healthy and consistent boundaries and then following up with them, you know, and noticing the details because the details are really important in allowing every single kid to grow and to learn and no matter what it looks like. All right, Abby. Hi. Um, so I only know, like I said, I've another student teaching, um, kind of what I've seen my cooperating teacher, Amy Luthi do. Um, and a lot of the time it's a matter of, you know, having the student maybe sit out for a second, but I've noticed she doesn't necessarily go up to the student. She's like, all right, you can join back in. But I've definitely made it a point, And I think I'm going to probably take this into my own teaching for sure. Going up to the student, kind of like hey, what everybody else has said, um, going up to them to ask them, hey, do you want to talk about it? No. Okay. Are you ready to be, get back in class to participate? Yes. Fantastic. Let's do it. Um, just trying to make that personal connection with them. Honestly, again, I don't have a ton of experience with it, so I don't really have a set answer, but I at least kind of have an idea of how I want to go about things. Now, of course, it will change just like everything else. Um, but that's kind of where I want to start, you know, creating that personal relationship with them, just letting them know they are safe, they can talk to me, and kind of just going from there and fixing it along the way, figuring out what works, I guess. Yep. And I want to state again, future professionals, you can go ahead and put some of your questions in the chat and we'll be opening, answering them. But we're going to kick it back to Chris. And I have a question here. How hard was it to adjust from student teaching to actual teaching and just making that transition and preparing for your first year? Oh, um, be nice of everybody's time because we do have a lot of questions in the chat too. Uh, the, the hardest part was uh, my first teaching job was high school right out of college and just uh, getting asked to prom twice by students was not good but uh, just it it's just it's just it's a struggle because like if you're gonna get if you're gonna go into an like a secondary job you're gonna be close to their age some of them um, you may be teaching 18 year old kids and you're only 22 23 24 and so that's that's a struggle of you know there's not a big age gap there and uh, also just um, uh, my advice for that is just when you get that degree, please don't stop learning. Always be a learner. Always be a learner because there are times where I'm just like, I cannot figure out what to do with this unit. Like I've tried this, the kids don't like that. And I may go over to Danielle's social media and see how she's done something, which here in a little bit, we're going to give you guys all our social media channels. Uh, for resources. And if you want to reach out with other questions, you could DM us. All our DMs are, well, Sean's might be closed because he's pretty famous, but um, uh, I, I would just say the biggest struggle was just, um, you know, the age gap was tough because I went straight into high school teaching. And then um, just, you know, that that was just, that was the hardest part for me. Just make sure you're constantly being a learner and uh, trying new things because some of you have already said it, um, our college college professors here in Missouri are phenomenal. We have some of the best higher ed doctors and just professors in this state in the country. Um, all of you have had a professor that has been nationally known somehow. And I'm not just saying that like from a UCM perspective, most state, Northwest, Missouri, so all of them have phenomenal professors and they prepare you as well as they can. Um, and Dr. Lynch is going to get mad at me for saying this. Remember, sometimes they haven't been in the classroom in a while and they'll admit it. Like it's changed. It's guys, it's changed in the years I've taught, in the years Anna's taught, Danielle, Sean, it, it's changed. It's constantly changing. So you've got to adapt. One thing one of my college professors told me was do not teach for 25 years. Don't teach 25 years. Teach one year or don't teach one year 25 times because that's going to, it's not going to matter. You got to teach 25 different years, 30 different years. You've got to change. And unfortunately, the bad stigma we get as physical education teachers is from those teachers that don't adapt, that don't learn, that don't change their ways and just 
it's true. The rolling out of the balls, guys, it, it, I've seen it. I've seen it with co-teachers when I taught the middle school and high school level. They're like, what are you doing for PE today? Oh, we're working on this. Oh, we're just shooting hoops today. I got, I got, I got to get my March Madness bracket ready. So we're going to do March Madness and PE. So be willing to learn, be willing to change and teach 25, 30 different years. Not all the same thing. I don't even know if that answered your question, Brooke. Sorry. Oh, I think it did. <laughs> Danielle? Can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> yes. yes. So okay. uh, how hard was it to adjust from student teaching to actual teaching and like preparing for your first year of teaching? Yeah. So I was a December graduate. So I student taught in the fall, graduated in December, and I was out in Stratford, Missouri. And so that's where I kind of I hung on my um, substituting uh, because there wasn't really a lot of openings at the time it, with it being January. So I substituted that way. I keep getting my experience and my foot in the door. And then, you know, May rolls around and um, I, I got married at 21. And so by the time I graduated, I was like 22 or 23. And in May is when I found out I was pregnant with my first child. And so um, some people want to hold out and get a PE job. I needed a job because I was starting a family. And so I went up to Eldon and I did family and consumer sciences for middle school and high school. And I also coached um, high school basketball, which was pretty interesting being, you know, nine months pregnant and having to ride the bus, you know, from Eldon to Marshfield, which was like 45 minutes. Um, but, and then you know, having the baby at the end of January and then having to miss, you know, districts and all that other stuff. So my first year teaching was pretty wild, you know, just being in the life situation that I was at um, and it not being PE either. So I had to learn a completely new content. Um, but kind of like what Chris said, you know, I still looked pretty young. I mean, I still get that sometimes now and I'm pushing 30. So <laughs> um I, I taught at Pershing and so I walking down the hallway that's a middle school and they're like hey why are you out in the hallway and I'm like I'm walking to my classroom what <laughs> so the age gap is definitely something and if you're younger and the kids kind of feel like they can treat you as one of their friends and not one of their um, teachers you gotta learn how to set those boundaries um, otherwise that could lead into other issues and so yeah I think just be flexible be adaptable and welcome challenges and just have a strong, positive mindset and you'll get through it just fine. Yeah. Sean? Yeah, I'm gonna kind of answer the question and I answer the question because we had some good ones in the chat and I wanna make sure I get to them. Um, but, you know, I kind of answered it. Uh, somebody asked the question, you know, it honestly, at the point I was when I got into the classroom and Danielle, you ain't, what you talk about pushing 30 here? And what you talk about, listen, I had my daughter at 19, all right? I was very, the, the untraditional student. But anyway, um, it, going, it's, you're, you already love what you do. So you're gonna give your all in the classroom. You're gonna give all to the PE content. You're gonna give all to those students, right? Really the hardest thing that I've learned because I've been in so many different environments in the educational setting is really learning the culture of the school that I taught in, you know, the climate of the school, the people I'm working around because you need their support. You know, you want them to value your classroom like they do math, like they do science, like they do social studies, like they do reading, right? So you have to be, you know, as you get yourself settled into your teaching role, you really have to be the advocate in your building for what it is that you do and what it is that you're teaching because you want you want what you do to be valued in your immediate space. And that's really the, the, uh, the challenge if you go into an environment that doesn't necessarily, you know, feel the same way about PE as you do. And I'll tell you all as, you know, future professionals is as you're filling out those applications and you're, you're interviewing for jobs, make sure you're interviewing those people as well, interviewing those administrators, you know, anybody that's in that room listening to you talk, make sure you interview them as well. Make sure, you know, they, they value what you bring to the table, what you offer and, you know, the, you know, everything that you have as a physical educator, because you don't want to jump into a situation uh, where you're not supported. And yes, the job itself has struggles, but as long as the people around you in your building have your back, then you're going to be okay. So keep that in mind. 
Um, and then also too, one question I do want to answer, I didn't want to type because it'd be too long, but uh, somebody asked, you know, how do you, because we talked a lot about relationships, how do you build relationships outside of, you know, school hours? Well, let me tell you this, all right? First off, you know, I got to do it for coaching, right? That, they're going to know you as coach anyway, but what you do, what you do outside of that school time is your passion, whether it's coaching, whether it's stuff in the community, but allow that to show, you know, I, I say it like this in high school, because, you know, high school is kind of my thing. In high school, coaching is a side hustle. All right. You get paid. You're, you're the majority of your stipend on, or your money, you know, your salary on that teacher salary scale is the hours that you put in as a teacher. And then the money after that is just, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, allow that passion outside of school hours to be showcased and make sure you're genuine when you're with your students about their time outside. When you're talking to them, ask them about their weekend, be genuine about it. Ask them, you know, certain students that really, you know, respect you, ask them how's it going with family. You know, some may tell you a lot, some may tell you a little, but they'll tell you, you know, what they, what they feel you need to know and, you know, still respect those boundaries there. So, you know, allow things that you do to really, really shine and my my big thing is i've been involved in the community outside of the school building why because we're the biggest advocates for our students outside of the school we're not just teachers we're stakeholders in a community we're citizens right so our voice matters and as you grow in this profession you will definitely find your voice to to uh advocate for a higher cause for those for those students i can you know i've been a part of when i was in springfield i was part of the naacp here where I am in Columbia, I'm part of the Mayor's Council of Physical Fitness and Health. So on top of Mo Shape and everything else. So, you know, really take part in your community um, and, you know, be a part of that and support your students in that. And, you know, your expertise outside of the building matters as well. All right, Chris, we're gonna kick it back to you for these hey, chat. Can, hey, Brooke, I don't, I mean, interrupt, but can I just say one thing while I ask? Of course. I, I wanna give a shout out to, my alma mater of Missouri State, um, because, and I know Chris Kirsten is on here tonight, and Sean is, and I know there's many of you that are on here from Missouri State, but I really have to give a shout out to them because they did a phenomenal job um, and just preparing us for teaching and student teaching and, and that transition um, to go so far as sitting us down and talking to us and this is this is in a really critical time between transitioning from a non-social media world to a social media world and I really think that we have to recognize that because sitting down and talking to us and saying listen y'all can't say this you can't say this you can't say this you can't say this in a classroom but just preparing us and saying when you go get a job your employers are going to check A, B, C, X, Y, Z. So if there is some, like, you need to make sure that what you are presenting and you are walking your talk. And I just give them credit that they did a, such a great job. Um, and I know Kirsten was actually never my teacher, but, <laughs> uh, you know, everyone at Missouri State did such a phenomenal job to, to really be honest about kind of that transition of, it looks like and so I just want to give kudos to them um in in, in saying what the biggest transition was because for me I graduated at a time where we were in living in a transitional from going from a social media non non-social media world to a very um intense social media world and that it plays a really big part in transitioning and being prepared to get a job. And so um, I'll just back up what they said. And, I, and Bear agrees because you can hear him in the background. I told you he'd agree with me or not agree with me right now. <laughs> um, whatever you are presenting, your social media thumb pit, your, your thumbprint on social media, that is permanent. So as a future professional, you have to make sure that what you are putting out there and understand that is going to be there forever. Okay, people can find it no matter what. It is permanent. So I think one of the biggest things and pieces of advice and just coming from a space that was purely 
in that, and I didn't even, I was not on social media when I graduated college. So, you know, maybe I'm the oldie, but I do still get disguised as a student, by the way. So Danielle, going back to what you said, there are people in the building that still like mistake me for a student, a student which is really awesome, um, which speaks to the, the um, amazingness to our profession because you walk your talk and it takes years off your life. So um, whatever you put out there is permanent and please make sure that you are representing yourself right now for years to come. So in a, in a professional way, the language, what you say, how you speak, um, what you choose to do, it is permanent. And whether it be whatever platform that is, just please remember that. And you are also representing not just yourself, but you're also representing Moshe as a future professional um, and your university. So that's, you know, that's my best advice and remind, reminding people of that. Awesome. All right, Chris. Yeah, so uh, just to be, uh, you know, thoughtful of everybody's time, we've got about a little over 10 minutes left. So I'm going to address some stuff in the chat. Uh, I also know some, like what our panelists have taught. And so some of the questions may not pertain to them um, or, you know, and I want to try and get everybody's questions answered. If you have some and you still want to ask it, please type in the chat. We can stay a little bit longer if you need it. And at the end of this, all of us will put our uh, contact information in the chat. We're not going to do it yet, and so it doesn't get bumped up by questions. So, Sean, hold up, hold tight. You know Anna's going to beat you to it anyway, so don't even try. She's already got it pre-typed, <laughs> so she does. I know she does. So um, we will share, share all our social media stuff and our emails. That way, if you have questions, um, two pieces of advice as I read some of these questions and answers. Uh, number one is please reach out to us if you have questions. Your, your professors are there for you. Your, if, if you don't think your professors are there for you, look at who's in the call tonight. They're here to support you, but we're here to support you too. Um, all of us on this call, this the six, well, five panelists plus Brooke, we're all part of the Most Shape board in some way. And so our number one job is everybody says, oh, you're the, you're, you guys are the boss or no, we are all physical educators first. And we are here to serve you. So please reach out to us if you have any. There's no, the only dumb question, so to speak, is the question you don't ask. And I'm telling you, there's times where I'm like, should I ask somebody this? No. And then I wish I would have. Uh, to piggyback off of Sean, because a lot of you are going to be doing interviews soon if you haven't. At the end of your interview, if the principal or whoever's interviewing asks if you have any questions, you better have questions. Because if you say no, I don't have any questions. My principal has already told me because she's interviewing for some positions in our building. If they don't ask any questions, they're not interested. So come up with questions. How do you support uh, physical education? What is your what is quality physical education to you? Um, how would you support my professional development needs? That's a big one. Um, so if you want some questions that you should ask uh, admin during an interview, I just direct message us and we'll get those to you. Um, Storm's question was answered by a few of us. Uh, Donnie's question has been answered a little bit. What is easier, more fun to teach? Uh, Sean has taught multiple levels. Um, I've taught every grade level. Uh, and Anna mentioned that it kind of just depends on your, like you and your niche, right? Um, I will tell you, I've done all of them. I love, love, love high schoolers on the football field and on the track not in the classroom. I just, I just, it's a different, it's just not my thing. It's not my, they're great. Kids are great. Kids are great. Five to 18 years old. I'm not saying that, but I don't have the lack of motivation at the high school level. And maybe that was my experience. My thing, like Anna said, I love kids. I love the little kids. There's nothing better to me than when a kindergartner comes up to me and gives me a hug. I'm sorry, I can't have a 16 year old girl coming up and giving me a hug. And, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. But for me, I think Anna hit that on the head. And Sean, you've done multiple levels too. I know Danielle's done elementary. She's taught different content areas, but uh, we all know what her favorite is because look where she is now. Um, so Sean, you can kind of comment on that as I'm going to get the next question prompted up here. Yeah, for sure. It was, it's definitely a personality thing, but 
I prefer high school. Why? Because you have, at that point, there's four more years in their life and they're gone. They're out there in the world and we know what this world can do, right? So you get four years to just be real with those kids. That's the big, that's why I like high school. You can just, you have four years within reason, but to be real with them about the world that they're entering. So that's why I love high school because I get the chance to just just to tell you how it is and still give you that love and support on your way out the door or, you know, across that stage. And Sean, and I love, and I love that. And I love, I love, I think that you feel called. I think that you know it. Um, I, I think, you know, where, when you find your niche, you just feel it, you know, um, Storm, you talked about middle school, I teach seventh grade. And so I'm a smack dab in the middle of this storm per se, no pun intended on your use of your name, but it, it really is. And um, I, I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, oddly enough, middle school is the only, only level that I did not do student teaching. I did elementary and I did high school. So I really think, but my first three years teaching were K through eight in a Catholic grade school. So I, I really think it's about finding your niche. And I really think it's about finding where you're, you feel called, you know, this is about a greater purpose other than you. This is something bigger than yourself. This is, you are here to serve. And, and um, you really, I just think it's the feeling that you, you know, you know, I love that Sean, that high school is his niche. I am, mm -mm, nope, not, can't do high school. Give it to him, you know, I, and I miss my littles but I can't do littles, you know, I miss the hugs from my littles so much, but I love my middle school kids because that's, it's like, you get to have fun with them. You have to be, you have to have boundaries with them, but man, when you get them, they are, they are yours for life. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, I don't know. I, I can't describe it, but I love teaching seventh grade. I wouldn't change it for the world. It's the hardest grade to teach, but I feel like, you know, putting some higher perspective in this for me personally, you know, God called me to teach this grade and that's really what it's all about and what that looks like in the bigger picture, whether it be this age group teaching in the classroom or teaching outside of the classroom um, with personal training or strength and conditioning or teaching them holistically, you know, it's, it, this is my jam. This is my age group. And I know it without a doubt. So I just feel like you just know, there's just like calling, you know, and it's really important that you find it. Yeah. Um, that kind of answers Bryce's question too. How did I know? How do you know what part of physical education you were called into elementary, middle school, or high school. And I think that kind of, you don't really know until you do it. Um, for instance, Abby Braley has, she, she's a phenomenal future professional. I'm really excited to see what she does. She spent time during her spring break to come to my school to do some extra observation. And we've talked, I've uh, done letters of recommendation for her, helped her get, uh, do applications and stuff. And I said, Hey, there's this elementary position. And Abby says, I, I don't think I wanted, I can do it elementary. And, and I said, you don't know until you try it. And then she said, she came to my school and she said, oh my gosh, I love your kids. It's a totally different. It also depends where you're at. You know, you may not like guys, the school I was at before I'm at now was 99% African-American population. And I just, I wanted the experience. I wanted to try it. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And that was a middle school position. I'll echo what Anna said. Middle schoolers are the most challenging, but if you can get and build that relationship with them, they're some of the best kids because you get a little bit of the elementary love with a little bit of the high school maturity, but middle schools aren't like mature like that, but like in the sense of they're growing and that's the time where they're growing the most and it's really awesome. Um, Anna also addressed that a little bit. Um, let's scroll down here. Danielle talked to Storm a little bit about that. Um, Bryce also asked the biggest struggle for you um, in the time teaching physical education that she, we should be ready to expect. I think we kind of all touched on that a little bit with our biggest struggles. Um, we can get it. There's let's uh, Bryce, if you want to talk about that, let's DM each other. There's certain things we probably, you know, not, not that it, things are that terrible. I just think, you know, um, 
the biggest thing if you've ever watched uh i don't even know what the show is expect the unexpected i don't know if that's survivor or what is that i don't know what show that is no it's big brother duh expect the unexpected because you we could go on a tangent of how the struggles we've had but Anna may teach in my same exact school with my same exact kids and have different struggles than I do. And I can go to her school and have different struggles than she does because we all have different personalities. We all have different things we're good at, um, except Sean, he's perfect. So Sean can go anywhere and teach everything. Um, that's why Sean's had, he's like been the director of every single organization in Missouri in the past two years. But uh, I'm trying to, because we've got like four minutes here. There was another really good question um, I appreciate the panelists that have been answering in the chat because I do, uh, I know Abby Braley does have to go at 730. She has a, uh, another thing she has to join and we're, you're free to stay and ask us questions still or chat. Um, what, okay. Abby Lingle asked uh, Twan. Okay. Uh, Sean, there was one, um, Dr. Lynch, nine years. I, well, thank you guys to the panelists for addressing the questions in the chat. That's, uh, Really good. Um, I'm not seeing any that we haven't really addressed yet. Uh, unless you, I skipped yours. Um, get at your boy Twitter IG at Coach Nevels and listen to the shit. There we go. So here's what we can do now. Just to be fair of everybody's time. Uh, panelist, please type in your Twitter, Instagram, and if you want to put in your email. Um, and I'm, I'm. This is your challenge, future professionals. And I know who's on here because this saves to my thing to my computer to repurpose this, you must, and you could do it to all four. I, I can find out. Sean, Anna, Danielle, Abby, and I, we meet all the time. You need to just say hi to us. You have to DM us on one of those things. And don't tell me you don't have Twitter or Instagram because I know you do. And if you say you don't because you don't believe in social media, you have a school email. I will find it. I will email your professors and say, what's this? kids email they didn't respond to me reach out to us for real um it, it's and there's gonna be something that pops up to you when you start student teaching abby brayley came to me i was like do you have any questions for me right now she said no and then five minutes later she goes hey i have a question and i'm like and i spent more time answering her questions and teaching so i got in trouble i'm just kidding but uh i i appreciate you guys being on if you have other questions and i skipped one i'm trying to go through the chat uh intimidation <laughs> yeah um and that's the thing. Uh, last thing I'm going to say, uh, because I've talked to Abby, I've talked to Brooke, I've talked to Abby Lingle, are a lot of future professionals. One comment that I want you guys to understand is I heard, like, for instance, at our convention, like some people were afraid to come talk to some of us like, oh, my gosh, that's Anna Forsolito. She's the president elect or that's D.C. He's the uh, Missouri teacher of the year or that's like I even heard somebody like D.C. and I were hanging out and they're like. Somebody was afraid to come talk to us. We're like, guys, at the end of the day, we are physical education teachers. That is our job. You may see Anna's face or my face on social media or Danielle's 5,000 uh, views on her amazing content. You better follow Danielle if you want some good activities, by the way. You may see us, you may hear Sean's angelic voice on podcasts, but at the end of the day, we're here to serve you. We're here to help you. And, uh, Anna, I'm going to let you do a parting word as the president and then let Brooke close it out as we're approaching 7.30, so. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, Chris. Um, I think parting words, and I and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, I think parting words for all of you are, I really love the challenge to please get connected. Reach out to me. Um, reach out to any of us on this panel. Um, you know, the theme for this year is sharing our story and you are hearing all of our stories tonight as we're connecting and forming relationships with all of you and it's up to all of us together our story as health and physical education in our profession it's not just one person it is all of us collectively and using our voices and connecting and forming relationships and, and working together in order to advocate for what we love to do and so share that, advocate that, reach out to us, put it on every single platform that you can put it on or send it out, send it out and invite any of us to come talk. If you want us to come talk at your, at your college, um, I'm happy to do so via Zoom and, and we can do something like this at, at a different university. I'm absolutely happy to do that. But I think please get connected and stay connected. Um, I'm, I love that all of you are here tonight. 
please come up, DM us, DM me. Um, I would have put my cell phone number in there, but you can DM me and I'm pretty sure I'll send it from that point. Um, but stay connected and just get involved. You know, the P I and, and try and get involved and ask your profession, your teachers, how to get involved and stay involved and they will advocate for you. Cause I'm going to tell you right now, I would not be here without my professors at Missouri state hands down 100%. The reason that I'm here is because Dr. Nelson, my first year, and this is, this is personal for me. My first year, you know, shape NOLA is this year. My first convention was AFERD New Orleans. And it was before AFERD. It was before Mo AFERD. And so I got involved because of that. I sat down and I was like, I want to do this. I watched future professionals in a session. And I was like, I want to do this. I'm going to get involved. And my professors believed in me and they helped me do that. And they advocated for me. And so I'm here because of that. So please, we are your voice and you are, we are here to help you have that platform to make a difference and you are our future. So that's what I'll say. Please reach out. We have, we are, we are here with each other, for each other. We're here to serve each other and to elevate each other, to be each other's voices. All right. So, you know, that's the wrap on our panel. Thank you guys for coming out. And also a shout out to our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to come answer some very important questions. So we'll just do like a little virtual applaud, but um, that's all we've got for you guys uh, to have your information in the chat. So you can take a second to screenshot that, write that down. And if you have more questions, they're going to be open to answering, but that's all we've got for you guys. And that's about it. Um, Hope you guys have a great night and thank you for coming.